All right. Uh, well, again, Carl Hawkinson with the University of Minnesota Extension. And uh, Katie, why don't you quickly introduce yourself? Uh, she's with Sustainable Farming Association. Yeah, I'm Katie Federal. Um, I work with Sustainable Farming Association for like fundraising and some communications, <laughs> multimedia things. Um, and the Twin Cities Gro Metro Growers Network is just a great little microcosm of SFA, which is a larger farmer to farmer network across the state. Um, there's chapters in different regions of the state. So um, this is kind of like our, our metro chapter basically uh, for the time being, but it's all about that farmer to farmer education networking. Um, soil health is a big focus of ours lately. We just launched a silvo pasture uh, program. Um, our soil health team got bigger this month by one more person. Um, yeah, but the, the goal is generally just to reach all kinds of farmers what, wherever they're at with uh, kind of sustainable practices, regenerative practices, and providing that the glue of the network and then educational opportunities, field days, and lately those are a lot online, but I know that our, uh, our soil team is working on getting some in-person um, field days this summer too. So if that's up your alley, keep an eye out for those. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Yeah. But yeah, reach out Thank if you have you. questions. And Katie is going to be monitoring questions. So if you throw them in chat down there, uh, we'll get to them at some point. Um, and then Reese Williams has joined us. Reese, you want to give a brief introduction? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Reese, uh, executive director of the Good Acre. We're a nonprofit uh, food hub in Falcon Heights, Minnesota. Uh, work with a lot of different farmers. Our mission is to try to build markets for them. So I farmed for a number of years uh, in upstate New York and in British Columbia, Washington State, and was partners with Featherstone uh, for about a dozen years down in uh, Rushford, Minnesota. So, and then I worked at Co-op Partners uh, for a few years as a buyer. Um, so I've been sort of kicking around for a while and, and, and at, uh, yeah, Good Acre, if you don't know about it, come by. Uh, we've been around about five years and hopefully we'll be a resource for small farmers. That's the whole point of the place, so. Yeah, it's right there next to the St. Paul campus uh, fields. And uh, so Reese has been on all ends of this farmer thing and has a lot of experience trying to figure out what we're gonna cover tonight. And uh, and uh, Jake, Jacob is gonna be our uh, shining example farmer here today. And uh, Jacob, why don't you just do a little introduction, and then we'll get into the get into the program. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Jake Jarecki. I have just started this year uh, my first season uh, farming solo. I'm doing you know the urban or in my case suburban farming methods. So I have about a tenth of an acre in production total, and uh, I'm using borrowed lots. Uh, one at uh, the synagogue I attended when I was a kid and the other at my friend's parents' backyard. And uh, so I'm just getting rolling and uh, we're called Feed Me Farm. And I'm at a couple markets, Minnetonka Market and Richfield Market and uh, just getting off the ground. It's been, you know, a month of production pretty much total. And I'm growing mainly a lot of salad greens and, you know, kind of high turnover stuff, um, small root crops, uh, only radishes and turnips have shown up so far, but uh, small root crops, a lot of greens, microgreens, and uh, that's about it. Okay, excellent. And we'll hear more from Jake shortly. And uh, so uh, I came up with this here. So you want to start a farm. And uh, we're going to highlight Jacob's operation just to illustrate the kind of things that are needed and, and what I meant. Uh, Jacob and I talked. I thought he seemed like he really was uh, doing a lot of things right, and 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 so uh, he agreed to to do this. So, if you have your farm dreams, what do you need? First off, you know, stop dreaming. <laughs> and one thing I wanted to stress was this is a huge challenge. Um, it's not going to be easy. And the two in the middle there are perhaps the most important. You can't do it alone and it's gonna take time. So these are just some of these things that I came up with. Um, I've never been a farmer myself, but I've hung out with farmers for 40 years and uh, have got a taste of this. Uh, <laughs> I've worked on farms 
Um, and this is what the people have told me. So there's a lot of physical work involved, obviously, and a lot of mind work. But it can be a deeply satisfying vocation uh, as opposed to a job or a career. It's a vital profession. We got to have food and we're learning more about the kind of food we should and shouldn't have, right? I'm going to follow my notes here. You're most likely not going to get rich, but you can be wealthy, if you know what I mean. Um, and I wanted to, I made this handout. If you go there, the one that's shown and it's linked there, maybe uh, Katie, you could put it in the chat. Definitely, yeah. So I found some sources that I thought made a lot of sense and completely different perspectives. Um, these are just kind of my summaries on the first page, but it's a bunch of different folks that said, well, what do you need to get started? And they all kind of said the same thing, but different things. Uh, the following pages printed out in more detail. And so I thought that was a good read for anybody that uh, is thinking about farming and there's some really good advice here. Um, so I put that together and I hope that was helpful. Helpful. We can, we can uh, use that if need be. I call it a handout, but I'm not going to be handing it out. I can't figure out how to get it through the screen. <laughs> All right. So here's the main parts of the puzzle. Uh, obviously you need some land, you need facilities, you need equipment, you need supplies. And those are all kind of related. You need markets and Reese knows something about that. And you need community. And by that, I mean, writ large, there's all kinds of different communities and you need some money. And uh, Sai, if you're with us, uh, we're going to tip into you when we get to that point. And um, what we're not going to talk about tonight is another thing you really need is how to grow stuff, horticulture, agronomy, livestock skills. Uh, but this is often the part in beginning farming things that are stressed a lot, how to grow carrots and beets and, and all of that. And that's super important. You got to have experience, uh, which is why a lot of the suggestions are go work on a farm somewhere and get some experience in, in addition to skills. So we're not going to be talking about that. And as alluded to, Jacob is going to be our uh, case study just to illustrate how heat one person did it. Um, and so we'll go through each of those puzzles, pieces of the puzzle. There's his website. And, uh, you know, there's no one way and we're not saying you have to do it like he did it, but, um, I think along the way we'll, we'll get some good ideas. And of course, this can all seem overwhelming at first, but Jake, why don't you just give us a, uh, a little intro of, uh, yourself and, and your farm and, uh, and how you got started and, and. All right, um, just got to make sure I'm not muted, right? Everyone can hear me? <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, great. All right, um, so, you know, I guess kind of to tell my story and my experience, um, these two pictures kind of fit. So on the left is the picture from the first farm I worked at. Uh, this was in Prescott, Wisconsin last year. So I, Let's see, I got interested in farming uh, just a couple of years ago. I was living in Portland, Oregon, and I was doing some AmeriCorps positions there in, in habitat restoration work and environmental education. It was not this, uh, this field at all, but I went to some conferences that kind of uh, clean water conferences in Oregon and, and some, a lot of agriculture folks were there and it sort of opened some doors. I started to meet with some people there just to pick their brain and I got really hooked on wanting to farm. I actually uh, I read a book that really got me, Restoration Agriculture by Mark Shepard, um, that was, it's all about, you know, tree cropping and silviculture and silvopasture and working, you know, in this large scale to kind of use farming as a kind of climate change solution to build carbon in the soil. And, and that's really what hooked me is I, I had like an environmental background and a kind of climate change research background. My degree is in oceanography, so I've changed hats a lot uh, since then. And anyway, um, got me into wanting to, you know, meet farmers and work on a farm. And I, I thought I wanted to have a bunch of orchards and cows and 
you know, save the planet that way. But uh, I thought I'd at least see what farming felt like and was ready to make a change and move back to this area where I grew up. And so I found this position in Prescott at a place called the Borner Farm Project. And they're just a small little farm uh, on like an old dairy farm property, but it's within the city limits of Prescott. So around it are residences. It's about, uh, I think about an acre total, maybe about a half of it is in production. And so um, they grew a lot of great organic vegetables. I was just learning the ropes there. We did pizza nights, which were the main like funder of the whole operation is that uh, they did these great farm to table uh, pizza nights where, uh, you know, whatever's fresh in the garden, we'd come up with some recipes and serve these big pizza nights that were a hit in, in this little town. So um, that was kind of my experience getting uh, my hands dirty and getting a feel for it. And in the meantime, during that process, I was uh, reading books and getting updated on, you know, how I could do it uh, on my own or what, what different ways were out there. And I got more interested in taking it to the direction of like the urban farming model, um, particularly uh, like I'm really doing pretty much by the book, the way Curtis Stone does his stuff. He's a Canadian guy who's been doing uh, urban farming for over a decade. And so, um, you know, his whole thing was you don't need to buy land. You can uh, ask nicely and borrow some and, you know, piece together small pots and focus on crops that work uh, in, in a, you know, high intensity, fast paced, small land based sort of approach. So that's how I'm getting started is growing on, um, you know, this lot here on the right, this is, this is my main plot. So that's, you know, where I'm starting this year. This is uh, behind my synagogue that I went to when I was younger. And uh, I brought them this idea this winter. Uh, they had a big patch of grass, I noticed, and it wasn't getting used. And I asked if, you know, I could do some sort of, if, if I could use that space and borrow their water and their walk-in cooler, which is a big piece of this. And, you know, a little bit of space to store tools and to set up my washing and packing facility stuff. And so that's kind of the home base. And, and that was really important to get, uh, you know, a good amount of space and most importantly, um, just some facilities in place. And then I've added on another small plot a uh, couple miles away and I think I'm ready to do another plot as well and start to, you know, grow a little bit more. And this is your first year of production? Yes. Mm -hmm. First think, couple months here. Yeah. Well, that's excellent. So what we're going to do is go through the different things with a little bit of what uh, Jake has done. Then we'll open it up and, and talk about it more generally. Um, it really looks nice, by the way. Well, thank you. Was that Prescott Farm? Was that Prescott Berg? Um, there, it's, it's the city of Prescott. The, the farm is called the Borner, B-O-R-N-E-R, Borner okay. Farm Project. And they're, they're still going strong out there. And uh, yep, just right across from Hastings, Minnesota. So this is uh, your land. Was I, this spring we were out, right? Yeah. And uh, right to the, to the right of your screen is 694. Uh, 494. Yep. Uh, yeah, 494. Sorry. Yeah, 494 runs the, yeah, just would it be west of the, of the building there. So uh, you kind of alluded to that, but uh, walk us through a little bit of how you were able to get this land. Okay. Um, so yeah, you're looking at a picture on the left of the, the larger plot at the synagogue. <laughs> and then on the right is the smaller plot uh, in the Hopkins at my friend's parents' house. So um, you know, so I went to, you know, I had this idea. I, I was looking for land. I talked to the board members at the synagogue and told them what I was interested in doing. And uh, that there, you know, there would of course have to be some kind of um, a reason to convince them to let me, you know, I guess make a living off of their land. So um, kind of our informal agreement is uh, I'm paying a dollar. I guess it's formal. I, I did. I would recommend actually a formal agreement for everyone. Is I, we wrote up a memorandum of use, and um, that's uh, that entails pretty simply. Uh, I pay a dollar a year, and I donate uh, to the ICA food shelf, and and it's kind of not a set amount. It's you know I'm starting to just learn how much my production is and how much my markets are consuming, and so. I'm just bringing what surplus I can over to the ICA food shelf and, 
and that's kind of the scoop. And then over at to the right at the, the lot at my friend's parents' house, um, I have so the size of the lot on the left is 100 feet wide, long by 40 feet wide, and then the plot on the right is 50 feet long by 20 feet wide. And so all my garden beds are standard size, uh, or I standardize the size to be they're 25 feet long and 30 inch wide beds. So you know I kind of calculate everything in bed units. So the left plot is 40 beds and the right plot is 10 beds. So um, yeah, and my friends' parents they uh, they graciously accept uh, a couple bags of salad and radishes so far each week, and uh, that's our informal agreement. And uh, they they turn on the sprinklers for me when I'm too busy to get over there. So neat. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Jake did a cool thing. He uh, after they cut the sod, he put it on eBay or Craigslist, and boof, it disappeared. Uh, you can end up with a lot of sod, and it's heavy, nasty stuff to move around. But I thought that was pretty clever. I didn't think about that at all when I when I cut the sod. All of a sudden, I realized there's you know thousands of pounds of sod to move. So. It's valuable, and the fr on the left, I had you know probably a thousand dollars worth of sod, and I gave it away for free. And I learned to try. You know, I sold the stuff on the right is the, is the oh, bottom I line. I, I would I would recommend it. You know, it's people are buying up sod, and you know if you can get. I, I had to rent a tiller and a sod cutter, so it paid for those rentals, which was helpful. Yeah, and you really don't want to bust up sod with a rototiller. You just make a mess. And you're going to get grass growing back if, if you don't yeah. take it out of there cleanly. So it says there that great Mark Twain quote, buy land, they ain't making any more of it. Um, but I think with starting out buying land, uh, how can you buy land when you're just starting? Uh, it's too expensive. You don't have the collateral or the capital. Um, and you're just starting out. So uh, this ties into a bunch of things we'll talk about. Start small. You got this land through your community, whatever that is. Um, so yeah, you, you don't need to own land, but you need to control it. There's a difference. Um, we did a study, I, I work with this uh, Twin Cities Ag Land Trust and uh, a guy that worked for us did a study. There's some 50,000 parcels in 11 County Metro <clears throat> owned by various municipalities. Um, and there's a, And that's just one kind of measure. There's tons of land and I think people's backyards is a huge untapped resource. Um, and you don't have to have 40 acres. And you probably don't want to have 40 acres of vegetables for starting out, it's not gonna happen. Um, but Reese or uh, any of the other farmers, you wanna, uh, any add your thoughts to how somebody gets started and access land? Um, I, I can tell you, uh, so I worked on farms for quite a few years before I started on my own and I didn't, what I did is I joined a land co-op in Southeast Minnesota. So we had access to a large piece of ground that six families owned. And so um, well, that's, how we, that's how we could afford it because it was expensive down near Rushford and we <coughs> were looking all around and found this piece and found our partners and, and turned it into a land co-op. So that's how we were able to do it. It's the most expensive thing you'll ever own in most cases. I mean, it's, it's the biggest investment you'll make. And if you're young and getting started and you're not sure, it's a tough one to invest that much money in something that you're not, you know, I mean, it's a hard business and you ne you, you're not going to make much money. It's a, it's a great business. I mean, it's a nice living that you can make out of it, but it's not a, uh, it's not anything that you'll make a lot of money off of. We, I was at Featherstone for about a dozen years and the most, I, I had a partner, Jack Hedin, and he and I, the most we made in that was we split 24,000 bucks. So that's 12,000 bucks a piece, you know? I mean, that we, everything went back into the farm. Every penny went back into the farm. So um, I, I feel like the, 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 Jake is, this is a good way of doing it. I respect the, the that starting small and getting to know what you're doing before making the big leap. Um, it takes a few seasons before you've really got your feet underneath you when you've seen different, and with climate change, things are, are more difficult than they used to be. So I feel like it's smart to, to, to just start small and don't try to 
conquer the world your first year out or second year or even fifth year. Just take your time. Reese, I missed, uh, I must have uh, got a bad connection. You said you started as a cooperative? A land co-op, yeah. Uh, land co-op, okay. Yep. And how many people was that? We had six families. Six families, yeah. So you shared the load, so to speak. Yeah, we invested 20 grand a piece. Basically, it was 120 grand for for 600 acres yeah. down in Rushford. Yeah. And so uh, I've been working with, uh, and some of you are probably familiar with the, we're doing the countryside. They have these land access navigators. That's in the back of this, uh, the back of this sheet. Uh, you know, if you're not from or of a community, um, this land access piece is tough. Then there's other groups like uh, Agrarian Trust and uh, Land for Good and Iroquois Valley. There's different people trying to figure out different ways to get people on the land without you buying it. It's just so expensive. You, you just can't do it. Any other any questions before we move on to the next uh, piece there's of the puzzle? In, yeah, there's go ahead. one in chat for uh, Reese. Uh, how did the financing work for the land co-op? You said each family contributed 20000 Yeah, and then the co-op bought the land. So it was owned by, it's called Zephyr Valley. And we were, there was three or four different land co-ops in that area. It was beautiful down there, down yeah. right in, you know, Winona, Rushford area. Oh, it's gorgeous. And so we all contributed to the co-op, incorporated the co-op, and then it bought the land. And so no individual family was on the hook for the whole thing. No, and it's still going. I mean, we, li we moved about 10 years ago and it's still doing fine. And then another one um, for anyone, how would you go about finding or starting a land co-op here in Minnesota? There's organizations that, and I, I'm sorry, I don't have them in front of me. We're in an area of co-ops. I mean, Minnesota, Wisconsin, people here do co-ops. I'm not from here, so. We wrote um, the book. Yeah, really. So there are organizations that you can find online uh, about how to do it. Or if, I mean, you can contact me and I can give you the people who, there is, there's law firms down in Southeast Minnesota that specialize in this stuff because there are some hoops you got to jump through, but it's not uncommon. Yeah, excellent. So uh, Looks like there's one more. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, this is a hot topic. Did you have... Did you have to form a board and stuff due to the corporation oh. rules? Can you talk a bit about the structure of the land co-op? We did have to form a board. Everybody was obligated to be on it. I mean, it was six families, two of us farmed. The rest, we started a charter school down there and we just sort of, we were all ex-Peace Corps volunteers and had lived, you know, so um, we did form a board. We made decisions that way. Um, but everything was consensus. It was a consensus driven process. And so you had to have complete consensus before you really made anything. And fortunately, we had a, a, enough people, like-minded people that we were able to uh, get things done. It's a pain, you know, it can yeah. be a pain in the ass, honestly, yep. trying to get consensus. But, you know, Lance Chi, I mean, it was a great opportunity for us. We had moved from Washington State. so. We took advantage of it, but it's a, it, you have to be very patient. Well, I'm going to, we're going to talk about that. We always talk about the physical work, but the paperwork and the people work is, uh, is a huge part of it. All right. Whoop. So, we're, so uh, facilities, you got to have some place to do what you need to do. Uh, Jake, why don't you tell us a little bit what we're looking at here? Mm hmm. So, uh, let's see, on the left there were my first transplants I started. I, I'm almost all direct seeding everything. Um, I'm not spending too much time with transplants, but I did raise uh, kale starters that uh, are getting close to being ready to harvest now. And um, that was about it, I think, this year. And so anyway, seedlings in there. I did microgreens a little bit in the winter under those. So just a shelving unit with uh, fluorescent lights hanging from it. Um, did some microgreens in there this winter, but um, pretty much just a little indoor nursery uh, for getting started in the winter. Um, then this is, you know, moving right. It's kind of my wash and pack set up. So um, 
this is just like in a kind of covered area near the plot at the synagogue. So I, uh, and I spent all day in there today. I harvest my salad greens and uh, it's a, a long process of washing and spinning and drying them. So uh, the tub there, it's a big stock tank that uh, I got at like Fleet Farm uh, that you would use to water cows. It's uh, just a big rubber tank. And that, you know, sitting on a wooden stand and behind it, you can't see mounted on that wooden stand is a jacuzzi pump. So um, that, you know, it's just this MacGyver contraption to uh, make a little bubbler to you fill up the tank, uh, throw the greens in there, flip the switch, and it bubbles the greens and, you know, agitates them and loosens the dirt off of them. And th that, you know, I saw on YouTube, um, a guy, Satin Hill Farms in North Carolina, they uh, um, just his wash station set up and it's you know, pretty slick. It's doing the trick. Um, so the wash tub and bubbler, um, and I wouldn't say a bubbler is absolutely necessary. You can just douse the greens in water and shake them up a little bit and let the dirt settle. It, it, you know, it, it does the trick. So then you have to start drying the greens. And so what I literally did was get a washing machine, an old washing machine on Craigslist there. And I got, uh, what do you call them? Uh, laundry mesh, mesh laundry bags. Like, um, you would take the summer camp and uh, I take these mesh bags and I fill them with the, you know, take a little strainer and scoop out the greens from the wash tub, throw them in the bag, put them in the washer and turn on the spin cycle. And it's just uh, an electric powered salad spinner. It spins them pretty good. The centrifugal force pulls the water out mostly. Then you take the bags and dump them on the drying table. That's the center image. So that's the, uh, I had a, a woodworking buddy who helped me put that together this winter. So by the way, all this stuff I got taken care of in the winter. So like I built all the infrastructure. I in filed for an LLC. I, you know, applied to my markets, like the paperwork in the, in the kind of facility stuff was all winter projects. So on that table, it's just a, um, a quarter inch mesh screen uh, stapled to like a big wide, you know, open frame and it's on hinges, so I can put the greens on top of that screen. I turn those two fans on above it. Uh, they're just zip tied, pretty simply there. Um, fluff them up a few times, and when, they're, when they feel pretty dry, put them in a tote and take them to the cooler. Then that, that table is on a hinge, so I can drop out the bottom and all the loose greens fall onto the floor, and I sweep them up later. So it's, you know, as I rotate between greens, I don't wanna have arugula stuck there when I'm getting the lettuce on there so it just clears off the, the junk so that's that's kind of it you know uh wash them spin them dry them store them and, and i i think obviously what you're seeing here is a lot of uh, creativity a lot of do it yourself you know you're going to be a farmer you got to be handy with tools and two by fours and things like that but you don't need fancy you just need stuff to work uh, but you do need a place to store things and there was a kind of a, I don't think it's heated or anything, but you have a, almost like where they used to store lawnmowers or something in there, right? Yeah, it, and, yeah, it's, it's not heated, it's just a covered area with like open gate doors, it's uh, open air environment. And if you're starting plants, you need a place for that. You need water, you need electricity. Um, you might need fencing and gates. I mean, you need some things to do what you want to do. Um, season extension. Low tunnel, cold frame, high tunnel, coolers, coal bots, storage. You need some facilities. Uh, you can't just do that out in the open. And so this synagogue situation really worked out great. Uh, any uh, thoughts on facilities from uh, anybody? In uh, Any questions? There is a question chat for okay. Reese regarding facilities um, and, and the <coughs> land co-op purchase. So when you did okay. the land co-op purchase, did it have a house on the land or any structures, wells, barn, outbuilding, <coughs> or was it just open land with nothing? Uh, it had two houses and two barns and two wells. Um, it was a working dairy farm at the time, so. And then it was another question or no? Uh, there was, but I guess for the sake of the, the audio recording okay. for uh, future listeners, uh, Jacob answered it. Um, 
the okay. kind of grow lights that he used were T5 fluorescents. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, related to facilities, of course, is tools. And uh, uh, all kinds of tools. And uh, Jacob, why don't you tell us some of the ones on the right that you figured was the most valuable to spend your money on? Yeah. So, you know, again, tools uh, were, you know, the things I chose to purchase were pretty much straight out of uh, the Urban the urban Farmer by Curtis Stone. Um, I have a friend, by the way, who, who's been doing this for a few years in St. Paul, it's pretty much exact same thing, borrowed lots. And so, um, you know, he's, he's following a very similar model, but, um, you know, having, having a mentor and his advice has been really helpful, you know, in choosing what tools to get and learning how to use them. You know, I bought all these tools, but, I, you know, couldn't teach myself exactly how to use them or how not to break them, most importantly. So um, a little hands-on advice was helpful, but the tools that uh, on the right are the ones that I'm uh, using that are highlighted here. The top one is a flame weeder. So, you know, that's an organic uh, kind of weed prevention method. So um, it's kind of the process is called the stale seed bed method. And you, um, you know, as you turn over beds, for instance, like now that I've finished my arugula started to bolt, I'm done with it. I, I cleared it out. I took a hoe and, and removed the root material and took a rake and scraped it all out. Then I covered it with a tarp for a week. And when I peeled it back up, some weeds had sprouted. I went through and hit it with the flame weeder. And then, you know, the next step was I, I dumped two more buckets of compost on to give it uh, some fresh nutrients. And I use the next tool down is called the tilter from Johnny Seeds. And it's a shallow tilling device that uh, um, it's powered by a, a drill, just a regular hand drill. And so that was one of the important tools I got, the tilter. Um, so I uh, kind of most important tools in my book, are the flame weeder, a broad fork. So, I, you know, broad fork gets some deep soil tillage, but it doesn't, it, you're not turning the soil on its head get in there and, and open it up and give it some lift, but you're not inverting the soil layers. So, you know, I, I, I broad fork it, I put the compost down, I use the tilter to, to, to mix that in and kind of fluff up the seed bed ready for planting. And then beneath that, I use the, um, that's the Jang cedar, uh, J-A-N-G. Uh, it's a mechanical cedar, it's really slick. You can, uh, you swap out these different rollers that fit in there and they take different size seeds. And uh, so then I can seed really densely there. I, you know, I plant, you know, nine rows in a 30 inch bed sometimes of, you know, different greens or, you know, it's, it's just very versatile. You can switch out different seeds and um, those are some of the most important tools. Let me see if I missed any. Uh, yeah, the, the flame weeder, the tilter, the seeders, uh, I use I use that one in earthway cedar sometimes too, broad fork. Um, oh, and of course I don't think it's on there, but really important uh, in what I'm doing is the quick cut greens harvester from Farmer's Friend LLC. It's super cool. It is if you haven't seen one, the quick cut greens harvester. It's uh, this device that is also powered by a drill, um, pretty slick, and it spins these cloths kind of fingers that uh, that pull the the greens towards a blade that's a reciprocating blade that also moves from the drill power and that simultaneously pulls greens towards the blade cuts them and then chucks them into like a cloth basket behind this so I harvest a bed of greens you know today I harvested uh, 60 pounds of different greens probably in you know under an hour just you know each bed is like two minutes and you just you know, harvest and dump them in a toad. So yeah, those are the tools that I, you know, I got to work with. I love those. So no matter what scale you are, you have to have labor efficiency. <laughs> mm -hmm. But interesting to note, he doesn't have a big rototiller. He didn't buy a BSC. He doesn't have a tractor. Um, you know, you need good tools, but you don't, you shouldn't go into huge debt to get all these tools. So you also have a pickup truck. You got an old pickup truck. Yep. That's really crucial. Got you got to have pickup. Some I like, I put this one up, uh, it's a flower farm out in uh, Wisconsin. They let their eight year old uh, paint their delivery van. Again, not a brand new fancy van, just an old Dodge van. Um, and then the middle there is that paper pot cedar that people seem to like. Um, 
but you can borrow stuff, you can rent stuff, tools, uh, you can exchange. So you don't have to always buy. Some things you need to have because, you know, when you need to plant, you need to plant. You can't wait around to next week to rent a, a cedar or whatever. So I guess strategic about how you spend your money. Any questions or thoughts from uh, anyone about tools and how to go about getting the, the right tools that you need? Got a question in chat for Jacob. Uh, can you talk oh, yeah. about your search for the pickup truck and how you, cho uh, how you choose the vehicle for your needs and level, et cetera? Yeah, so um, my search wasn't very thorough. Uh, I'll be the first to admit there was a, a pickup truck for sale in the parking lot of my apartment building, and I happened <laughs> to be uh, looking for one. And I, you know, I was looking on Facebook Marketplace and on Craigslist and uh, <coughs> Auto Trader. You know, I, I was looking at other stuff, but I, you know, saw this one and called the guy. And um, and you know, I don't know a thing about cars. I can't even drive a stick shift, so you know, I I I don't know how to how to buy a truck, but I have a friend who, you know, used to sell cars and he helped me take a look at this thing. He said it was a pretty good uh, truck. Um, it's a Dodge Ram uh, 1500, 2001, like a uh, hundred thousand miles on it. So it still had, has some good life in it. And it, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was a good price and it's had some trouble. I already had to put a thousand bucks into it. So, you know, maybe I should have shopped around more, but it's, it's working. Okay. I needed a new fuel pump and uh, you know, that, that cost, but, uh, in general, um, it's been reliable. And I think, uh, I, you know, I might, uh, just cause I don't know how to shop for cars in general, I, I would recommend, you know, it's a big purchase and, you know, find an expert to help you out. Maybe find your gearhead friend. Yeah. And, and that harks back to the community thing that I'm going to emphasize. Um, you can get a van, you can get a truck, you can get a minivan, you can get a trailer hitch and have a trailer. I mean, there's more than one way to do it. Um, but you're going to have to have something besides uh, the family sedan. There's, so Zofia asked another question here. Um, it said, what, what would you get next time? Um, <laughs> truck in parentheses. And I'm, um, I guess, I'm assuming that means you're asking if, uh, if I would get another, a truck again or, or what kind of truck. So, um, for, you know, just to answer the way I'm interpreting it is I would get a truck for me because I, you know, I, the truck can haul all my tools and all of my produce, you know, I can fill the bed with whatever I need. Um, but most importantly, I needed, I filled the truck up, you know, 10 times with you know, two yards of compost at a time, you know, probably throughout the, these last few months. And so, um, if I had a van, I couldn't fill that thing with compost. You know, I could get a trailer and pull that, but in general, it's just the most versatile. So I, I like the truck. Yep. There's no one way and, you know, used vehicles, good to budget that there's going to be repair and maintenance on whatever you buy. Um, yeah, that, that is a given. So I'm going to uh, move on to the next thing, which is totally related, but something we don't think about. I don't know if it's tools, I don't know if it's supplies, I don't know if it's facilities, but you need to buy seeds every year. You need gloves and you need netting and you need buckets and you need tools and mulch and fencing and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that all costs money too. Um, and the one thing I would say there is if you can spend money on good tools and take care of them, they'll last a long time. Um, any surprises or uh, thoughts there, uh, Jake, on, on the whole kind of supply realm? Um, uh, I mean, it's it okay. all looks, yeah, pr pretty, pretty standard. I mean, like heat mats and grow lights and stuff, I, I don't have those, but only because I'm not, so far, not focusing on really much transplantable stuff. Um, uh, and insecticides and fertilizer, um, I'm, I'm growing Organ with organic practices, so I'm not using that. Same with straw and uh, other mulch. Uh, I'm not using it. I know it's valuable, but uh, it's, you know, for now, I, the kind of the, the way that, and the theory behind how I'm doing a lot of this is that I seed so densely that a lot of these greens, they grow up so fast, they shade out the weeds that would come up behind them anyway, and then they create a good, a good amount of shade of the soil as well. So they kind of act as a mulch and keep you know, the soil from drying out too terribly. Well, good. I, I didn't want to spend too much time here, but just to say there's other expenses. Uh, 
I know uh, it's Good Acre is kind of a different deal, but uh, you spend a few bucks on supplies over there at Good Acre. <laughs> the things you don't think about right off the bat. Uh, we've got, yeah, we do. We have three hoop houses. So I mean, hand um, towels and yeah, you know, yeah. stuff you just don't think of. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so there you go. Let's just move on to the next one. So uh, um, whoop, and of course you need markets. You can grow the most wonderful vegetables in the world, of course, but if you don't have any place to sell them, uh, it's not gonna help. And kind of a chicken and egg situation if you're a new grower, people like to see a track record kind of a thing. The same with getting a loan, we'll talk about that. But um, so there's the laundry list of kind of your general outlets. Um, but uh, Jake, why don't you start off telling us how, uh, how you found your markets and, and where you're marketing. You mentioned it a little bit early on. Yeah. Um, so I am at the Richfield Farmer's Market on Saturday mornings and the Minnetonka Farmer's Market on Tuesday afternoons. And that was just kind of a, a broad search. I mean, I kind of, I wanted to be selling near uh, where I'm growing. Just, you know, my whole uh, approach is that I, you know, I'm growing in these suburban areas where I can make it back and forth between my plots pretty easily and my where I live, you know, it's all pretty close to each other. Um, I was looking for markets nearby. I, I think I went to the Minnesota Farmers Market Association website this winter and started to, you know, see what was around and just, you know, was sending out emails to you know, keep, keep an eye on this if you're looking to start a farm because um, applications are always due kind of you know, middle of the winter. And uh, so you got to have those, you know, you don't want to miss the deadline and not be able to get into your market. Um, so yeah, I'm at two markets and I have uh, been trying to build some restaurant sales or grocery store sales, things like that. So, you know, those haven't really panned out yet, but um, I sold a dozen bags of salad to a local grocery store recently. Um, they kind of got buried away behind all the other salads, so it didn't move very well, but I'll bring in more in a week and we're going to make a display and stuff. So, you know, um, I'm, I'm working on, you know, trying to get some steady bulk orders cause that would really help. I'm kind of at a level where I'm producing enough. I just, I'm, I'm having a surplus at the moment. So I need to start to find markets. And, and wasn't one of the original ideas to sell to the daycare at the synagogue? Oh yeah. Um, but, you, but that's closed, I presume. Um, no. So, so yeah, let's see. And I, there were a whole bunch of ideas. I can't even remember <laughs> what we discussed, but uh, so they do have their preschool going on again. Um, but I was going to try to maybe do, you know, I, I was, I was considering like CSA shares uh, offering them to the congregation and seeing who was interested. But um, I shied away from CSA shares this season because uh, I just had no clue what my production capacity would be. And if, and if I, you know, said I'll, I'll sell 20 CSA shares and I came up short every week, it would be a bad look. So I wanted to, um, you know, see what I can sell and, you know, at my markets and see what I can grow and then kind of just keep good numbers and, and, I'm considering doing a, a second half of the season CSA, like, you know, uh, 10 or 15 week CSA, July, August, September, or something like that. Um, where, you know, now I have a feeling I, I can produce enough and um, that might work. So. No, oh, that's really excellent. And uh, Reese, let me tap on you here. Um, what would you say, uh, you know, for beginning farmers like Jacob or those that, I've been going at it a year, but maybe want to scale up a little. I mean, what are the main um, messages you would say to farmers about this whole thing of marketing? And I'm thinking, you know, how to go about it, but how much time invested in that sort of thing? So, um, so we started the Good Acre in order to expand markets for farmers. I sold into the Twin Cities for a dozen years with Featherstone, we were a pretty big farm, sold all the co-ops and, and, um, and, and I knew that there was, and then I worked for co-op partners where we bought a lot of produce from small farmers. I knew there wasn't a lot of opportunities for farmers from underserved communities, um, having been selling into the wet, you know, we sold into all the, all the co-ops. There weren't a lot of Hmong or Karen or Latino growers in there. And I knew through co-op partners, same thing, we didn't buy a lot. Some, I mean, there's some really good growers out there, but it's kind of a it, older farms 
kind of stay in those markets and they pay the best. And restaurants, similarly, the best restaurants pay the best. They have some standard farms that they go to um, and, and get good product. And so you can't really, you can't really argue with that. So what we wanted to do is expand this thing. And I think, like, uh, I, I feel like the University of Minnesota, I feel like hospitals, are, they have an obligation to feed their community with stuff that's grown in their community. I, I, it's, it pisses me off that there's such a lack and such a disconnect between the food that is bought from California or Mexico during our season. I mean, like now when we got greens and red, they're buying, they're still, you go to these places and they're serving stuff from, they're buying, they're going strictly by price. So I, that's kind of my place to be. I feel like we, our job is to pound on these places. Minneapolis Public Schools is a tremendous resource. We're very lucky. They buy local. They, they're committed. They're a national leader. Yep. Um, others, we work with 32 school districts. That's what we do. That's what our niche is, is school districts and helping. We do trainings of, of lunch ladies. That's kind of our gig. Um, so I, I really... That's what I want to promote and hospitals and, and get local produce in there. This year is going to be a weird one. This one's going yeah. to be a hard one, I feel like. Farmers markets, because of the restrictions by COVID, are going to be down. And they closed a full, you know, during George Floyd's murder, they, they were totally closed. And that hurt many small growers who harvested yeah. um, for that weekend. And so um, I feel like it's interesting. In 2008, the economy tanked. CSA shares exploded. I worked at Co-op Partners at that time. I'd just come up from, from Featherstone. And we were busier than we've ever been. 2008, 2009, 2010, it was party time for local products. And because the, the economy was diving and people were going with the familiar, they wanted to feel safe, they wanted to feel secure. They actually bought from local farmers. It was really good. Um, it's same thing is happening now. I don't, I know many, we have three different farms in our building. Um, shared ground is in there, Hoff is in there, we're in there. We all sold out of our CSAs extremely early. We, I mean, we sold out really early. Hoffa doubled their size and so did um, shared ground because the demand was so strong. Yeah. So I feel like it's gonna be an interesting year because I don't think, I don't think it's, you should really commit on that. I mean, I don't feel like you, people should just turn around and say, okay, I'm a CSA farm because next year it could change, you know, and CSAs are hard and, and, and they were, the number of CSAs in the country has been going down and in our area, it's been declining. Yep. Um, some of the older farms that had them for a number of years have retired and they haven't been replaced. Um, so I feel like what I, for someone like Jacob, I think he's doing exactly what he should be doing. Is it starting off slow, selling into your community, building your reputation, get in the grocery store, get your label out, get your name on it, so people recognize it, so they want it. And that's what we did when we first came up, when we first started at Featherstone, we went to Winona, we went to the Winona Co-op and all the little restaurants, just so people would know who the hell we were, because we had come from out of state, we didn't have any experience in that place. So I think it's really important to establish your name in your community and, and just take your time, learn your land, learn what you've got, learn what, you know, what your soil is. Um, because you really, there's, I, I'm sure on Jacob's piece of ground, he's got sandy places, he's got clay. That's just the way it is. That's just the norm. And you don't know that until you've been on it a couple of years when you can adapt your crop rotation to the soil you have. Yeah, that's excellent. And you mentioned the. I hope that helps. Yeah, that does. The, the, the established growers and the established restaurants, um, they got it all figured out. They like their system. It, it, it's super competitive out there, right? Yeah, and they're really good people. I mean, Birchwood yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. Oh, they're the great people. Yeah. You know, but they do. They, they've been going to Harmony Valley, which is a farm down in Wisconsin, one of the better farmers in the area for years. What, you know, so they stay with Harmony Valley, you know, they're yeah. damn good at what they do. Yeah, no, that's excellent. That's excellent. Um, um, yeah, so 
and I hope uh, the CS food, you know, I went to buy a little seed for my garden this year. Seeds were tight. People were, I hope we can keep this local gardening CSA thing going. Uh, I hope, you know, that we can not go back to normal in a sense. Um, so it's really interesting what you said about 2008. I didn't realize that. So, I mean, it's, it, can I just say one other thing? It's the suburbs that we really need because, you know, the city, the Twin Cities are way ahead of the curve. I've farmed yeah. in other places. Markets there, co-ops are tremendous, tremendous yeah. advocate. But it's the burbs, it's Lunds and Byerly's, it's Kowalski's, it's, it's these grocery stores that need to buy in. And it's, and it's, it's taken a lot of time. Yeah. I'm sorry, Katie, was there a question? Or? Yeah, there's a, a couple here. Um, so first of all, are there any license or certifications that people <laughs> should be mindful of when trying to get into markets or restaurants or um, yeah, specific institutions? Maybe we can throw in schools in there. Um, I mean, for, I'll, I'll jump in just from my experience, you know, to, to there are lots of certifications I'm sure that I haven't gotten and I might need down the road, but uh, I needed, you know, to have a registered company that was important, you know, tax ID and all that stuff. And then um, liability insurance. And I think someone there asked like how much that was for me, it was like 400 bucks. It wasn't, wasn't bad for the year. And that's like a million dollar policy covering any, I think injury on the properties I'm growing at, plus, you know, any, anything, if anyone were to get sick from the products, for instance, uh, and also adding the markets I sell at, like there was a requirement at the Richfield market to list them as additionally insured on my insurance policy, not the Minnetonka, but the, you know, same thing. And now I'm applying uh, to be a vendor at Lakewinds co-op and they required a, um, also a certificate of additionally insured on my liability policy. So that's, that's a big one. Yeah, different markets have different requirements. Did anybody require that, uh, you know, there's this generally accepted practices, food safety world. Did, did you uh, go through any of that? Um, I, not specifically for the farm. What, so I, I did want to be doing, and it's, it's all on hold, but I wanted to be hosting um, some farm to table dinners at the synagogue. They have a commercial kitchen and a big social hall. And I was really hoping to be doing some kind of dinners. I, I've had a lot of restaurant experience and I love to cook. And, I, and I, I, you know, I figured it was another way to kind of make a, a prettier penny than selling just produce, uh, especially on small scale. So um, for that reason, I got, uh, what was it called? A kitchen, uh, I forget the certified kids food safety manager um, certification from the health department. So that's and, not required to grow the food, but it is if you want to do any kind of service of it. And the health department and then the department of ag has done a lot of work the last couple of years with the whole cottage food realm and streamlining and making what they do much more accessible and, and, and common sense for really small growers and like yourself. Um, so they're, they're catching on to not just serving the, the big corn and bean guys. Um, uh, I mentioned that, so for growers over, I think $250,000 or something, isn't it, Reese, they have to have this certification program. Uh, and then anybody under that, it's a good idea to go through the training and have it. And, and University of Minnesota, Annalisa and yeah. others are damn good at what they do. Yeah. So it's a really good resource making food safety kind of, easy to understand because there's a lot that goes into it but those Annalise and her team really do a great job of, and we have classes at the Good Acre once we have classes at the Good Acre we'll, we'll have others we've had them all constantly so you can look her up or you get a hold of me I can and sh they have classes uh, they're doing some now for farmers markets it's really common sense stuff it's good to go through because um, you don't want to make anybody sick uh, any questions about the market thing before we move on I'm just, it's eight o'clock now, so we're in good time. Was there any questions, Katie? Um, not specific to markets. Uh, so oh. I don't know if we want to save them for the end, because I think you're pretty close on the slides there. Yeah. 
Well, I had one question, Reese. I was, uh, so if a, a farmer or a farm couple or whatever, if they spend 100 units on growing and the physical labor part, how many units of marketing is necessary? <laughs> you know where I'm going? How much time does marketing take up? Uh, you know, um, as much as you'll let it, I yeah. hated it. Um, uh, <laughs> that was one of my first hires when, when we started the Good Acres, finding yep. someone who was good at that. Um, it takes a lot, you know, it, 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 it depends on where you're going. You know, um, if you're going to, for us, for the Good Acre, we're trying to pound on places that aren't necessarily listening to us. So we, we do it a lot, but even at, at the, at Featherstone, I mean, it's, that's what the winter is for, you know, that's what, that's what you do during the winter is just keep going around as much as you can. And then as soon as you have product, you sample. You know, I mean, you find if, if, if Jake goes into Lake Winds, they'll probably want him to sample something, you know, if he gets into the co-ops. I mean, it's just part of the game um, and it's worth it. It's just, yeah. it takes you know, time. If, yeah. And if you're, you started this to be a farmer. And so anything that takes away from that seems like it's, you know, not what you want to be doing, but. No, and I've I got a slide on that coming up, but uh work with all kinds of farmers from small farms to Jake, big dairy farmers. Uh, they didn't, people didn't get into farming because they like to do paperwork. But uh, as Jake has talked here, I hope you picked up that he's done his homework. He's called and he's researched and he's done this. You have to do that sort of thing. So and, uh, can I just that, say, yeah, Carl, I, I like the successful small farmers that I know do everything pretty well yeah. you know i mean that's it they're, they're just pretty good at everything and they don't i resented having to go out and sales <laughs> and that wasn't the best attitude to take no. on my <laughs> sales calls but you know like yeah buy the damn lettuce <laughs> would you <laughs> yeah exactly it's great you know just take the damn stuff um but the young farmers that i know who who um who have trained a lot and who've got a lot of experience they, they just accept it as part of the game and, and are pretty good at it, so. And that fits into this next slide. Um, and that's a picture of a composting project I did in North Minneapolis. It has nothing to do with market growing, but I just thought it was a great picture of community. Um, and, you know, you just can't do it alone. And, and to the marketing thing or the needing somebody with the pickup truck skills, you need people to help you. and. And uh, by community, I mean the whole thing. Family, friends, other farmers, your spouse, your partner, your business partners, your labor, your neighbors, advisors, bankers, mechanics, your farmer's market manager, mentors, people with different skill sets than you. One of the tricks I think, Reese, where you're going at with the successful farmers is it's some division of labor where people are, uh, are better at some things and not others. Uh, for example, I used to work with dairy farms years ago and the ones that uh, family farms that, you know, got pretty big but were successful, one sibling really liked working with the cattle and another one was a gearhead and kept the machinery going and the other one was a people person. So you, you need, you can't do it all. Um, and so Jake, uh, I got a few shots that you sent me of uh, part of the community that helped you get going. Uh, yeah, those are just uh, some friends. Um, you know, I I work at a restaurant. I, I it was pretty fortuitous for me that I got laid off uh, in you know end of March, right when I really needed to quit anyway and and start getting the farm rolling. And so I, you know, also a bunch of my friends who worked with me uh, had all the free time in the world. So these are some restaurant coworkers that uh, helped me out with the compost party for a day and. They've, you know, the same folks have been coming by and helping me bag up my salad greens and things like that. So I, you know, just have recruited a few friends that are happy to help. And, you know, that's, it's, you know, I do have a good social network that helps, but, you know, I wouldn't be discouraged if, if you don't know where to start looking because a lot of people want to spend some time doing something healthy and outdoors. And, they, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of people open to participating. If you look on Craigslist and Facebook and, you know, 
get on social media or, you know, the bulletin board at your coffee shop or something. If I think you, you can find people who will do some free work for you, especially if you pay them in radishes. So I, I generally work for a six pack. So yep, yep. But I mean, helps. you'd still be out there spreading compost and, and, uh, um, you know, you, no one is an Island. And, uh, I think one point I'd like to make is that people have more resources perhaps than they think they have when you start looking around. I think another thing that people that like to farm is they tend to not reach out and kind of, we can do it. I can do it, you know, and be stoic that way. And that that's just not going to help you. And, and there's your lovely pickup. Yep. Uh, Clifford, <laughs> the big red truck. <laughs> So, and your customers are a huge source of your community. Um, and so, uh, so it, it, this all comes to human relations, people relationships, and, and that takes time too to cultivate. And so, um, but I tell people all the time, it, it really pay attention to who's around you and they'll be glad to help you. Um, so, hey, Sai, are you still with us? Well, uh, we're going to jump into how you work with Jake and the financing, but why don't you just quickly introduce yourself? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, again, my name is Saitel, and I'm with uh, Compare Financial. We're a farm credit association um, serving the upper Midwest. Uh, my colleague, Paul Dittman, and I oversee a program called the Emerging Markets, um, which was uh, designed to uh, provide loans to farmers that sell directly to consumer. So it could be some two channels, uh, such as farmers market, food hubs, retail, school, CSA, both sides stand, just, just like what Jake, Jake is currently do, doing. Um, so that's what I do. And uh, again, my primary role is to uh, prov provide loans to um, non-traditional farm farmers. So Sai and, and, and Paul that he mentioned have this separate program. Comp here does all kinds of financing for big farms and rural land and all kinds of things, but they've really gone out of their way to help emerging farmers with micro loans and low interest loans. And uh, Jake, why don't you tell us how you hooked up with Sai and, and what you guys came up with? Well, I hooked up with Sai because Carl, you told me to. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> no, uh, I, um, I, I, I reached, you know, the reason I'm even here is because uh, I, I think I just came across the Hennepin County Agriculture Extension Office. Um, I can't even recall how, and uh, heard you know that Carl was a point person to talk to. Reached out to him, and he met me at the synagogue in the spring before I even stripped the sod off. Uh, just took a little walk around with me and, and left me with some paperwork and some resources. And part of that was um, some farm loan information, and so I. You know, I thought I had borrowed enough uh, to begin, but I, I or saved enough and borrowed some, and and you know I, I did a little borrowing for my family, so that's you know that's a a, a little privilege that you know, is not available to everyone. But um, you know, I I ended up realizing I needed some more and um, went to Ty at or Ty, excuse me, at Compere, and they have just some really you know low interest options, so. Uh, it was pretty a pretty fast process. He was really motivated to help me, and I was kind of in a rush, and uh, it worked out. I was able to get the, you know, that was most importantly was the truck. Uh, I couldn't afford it without the loan, and you know, there's some bigger tools and supplies in the process that I still hadn't purchased after my seeds and some other stuff. You know, I needed money for compost still, just a few things. So, um, got a, a loan from Compere and. I forget the interest rate, but it's, I mean, it's pretty low. It's, it's a lot. I went to a bank to talk to a banker about a loan and, you know, they couldn't even come close to the affordability that was available with Compere. They probably didn't know what you were talking about. No, true. They were like, what kind of business is this? You're, you're farming in the, in the city, uh, you know, no. you gotta, you gotta find resources. It's the same thing for when I got insurance, um, you know, trying to go through standard insurance companies mainly. Um, no one's going to try to ensure something like what I'm doing. It's just uh, they don't have any experience or background in, in how that would work. And, and uh, so I found, uh, I think it was the Farmers Union in St. Paul. Um, my, my urban farming buddy 
he uh, he went through them and and so I you know they knew exactly what I was doing asked me a few simple questions and got me a really cheap policy too so go to the right people who who understand what you're up to and um, um, and of course there's also there's regular banks and there's credit unions and then there's uh, USDA FSA Farm Service Administration has loans um, for minority women beginning farmers rancher loans and Native American tribal loans. Um, and then um, Department of Ag, through their Ag uh, Rural Finance Authority, has all kinds of programs. Uh, I don't know if, Katie, if you can Google that and, and link the FSA and the uh, Minnesota Rural Finance. But That's Cy, nice. maybe, yeah. if my, if Cy, if you want to tell us a little bit about how, uh, how you work, when, uh, when uh, somebody like Jacob comes up to you and says, I need a loan for my for my startup, what are you looking for? Yeah, the, the, the first thing we ask for is a business plan. And uh, that's usually where a lot of farms struggle. Yeah. Um, you know, it can be pretty, pretty daunting, right? So what, well, you need a business plan to farm? Uh, uh, yes, you do. You're, you're not just <laughs> and, gonna and, give me the money? <laughs> right, right, because if we wanna know what, what, what are you doing, right? And how much money you need. Um, but, you know, one thing, on a micro loan, we, uh, you know, basically we just need a page or two page. So we don't need a 20 page or 30 page uh, business plan, something very simple. Um, not all part of the uh, business plan or create an equal. And so like, for example, when I was going through uh, Jake's plan, what I really want to see is, okay, what's the part uh, the marketing, the production, the financial management uh, plan. Right. And so, the first thing you highlighted in there was like, okay, what's the potential customers? Uh, you know, what, what is the, uh, the, the pricing on its product? Uh, what the marketing channel? And back to what Jay listed, you know, like the farmer's market, CSA, food hubs, retail, and roadside stand, CSA. So that was helpful. Um, you know, the, the management part uh, was, you know, Jake highlighted some of the, uh, you know, production costs. And that really helped um, because, you know, for, generating like 24,000, if I recall, on a, um, you know, a quarter acre lot is, uh, is something that we have not seen, right? Or many of our conventional, um, you know, lender have not seen, uh, you know, and then <clears throat> I was, another big piece is, uh, you know, how, because we want to be responsible too, and this is a debt, right? And we don't want to power up any more debt. Um, and so, I think initially, uh, you know, Jake started out with 10,000 and, um, you know, asked Jake to put together a cash flow. I think we got it down to um, like 7,500, which makes sense. Um, it's still, you know, there's still cash available. Um, you know, when we did a uh, month to month projection, and that, that's very important because, you know, a lot of farmers come to us, which just put together an enterprise budget and say, this is how much money I'm going to make. But month to month is so critical because a lot of farmer, uh, you know, especially those that rely on farmers market, you know, the first half of the year, there's a lot of money going out, but no money coming in. And, um, you know, there are cash shortfall. And a lot of these small farmer end up, you know, charging on their credit card. Um, I see a lot of that. Um, so sometimes I encourage a uh, farmer, you know, take, let's, let's take a look at it together. If the cash shortfall during those early six months, uh, maybe we can get an operating loan. Um, something along that line. Um, we want to make sure that uh, you know the farmer can pay the bill. So when I was working with Jake, I want to make sure that the cash coming in, um, you know, can help pay the bill. Not only uh, you know farm expense, but also living uh, expense is critical. Another big uh, important document is the balance sheet, because ultimately you farming, if you want to you know generate, you know, build some wealth, basically everything is on the balance sheet. Your net worth, that's when you want to see it grow. Um, you know, the balance sheet is a snapshot of everything you own, everything you owe. Um, for lender, they don't want to, or they don't lend 100%, you know, of the project cost of, of the business. Um, you know, they normally want to lend as less as possible and have you put as much equity uh, as possible, right? So when you look at the asset, asset side, and then we do what's called debt to, you know, um, <clears throat> asset ratio, what portion is owned by you, what portion is owned by the, the bank. So what partner? Um, and that's how I like to, um, you know, say it. And, you know, we 
uh, micro loan, we don't need tax return. But sometimes, you know, if you have tax return, that's great uh, because that verify, you know, some of your non-farm income. If the business can't pay it, can the, you know, the, uh, you know, all farm income uh, cover the loan? Um, and so that's when we ask about tax return. But on micro loan, um, you know, it's not a uh, requirement. Um, <clears throat> a lot of time, what I see is once. A farmer complete all that, provide the business plan, financial document, but they don't lay out the details, sources, and use of fund. Um, and so I have farmer come to to me and said, you know, what's the max amount I can get? And that that's uh, you know for a lender that's that's a that's a turn off. Um, you know, it's a big risk. And so for when Jay came to me, he lists you know pretty clear all the supply and equipment that that he needed. Um, including the the truck, so we kind of put it together, um, and then when I looked at it, okay, the total project cost was approximately like ten thousand. You know, Jake put him in twenty five hundred. We can do you know seven five hundred in this case. So we got some skin in the game, and and that's the lender. It's important. Um, and one other thing that we see a lot too, um, you know, it's the for for young beginning farmer, these the student loan, and a lot of these folks that came to us with a student loan, they can't qualify for a conventional loan. Um, there, there's no way. Um, you know, in, in Jared's case, that was factoring in because we factor in the farm business, um, you know, balance sheet, and then also the personal. So we consolidate everything together. When you have a student loan, that's a negative net worth, um, and that is a uh, you know, but with our uh, micro loan, we, you know, if you get if you get a degree, then you know can help justify it. But if you rack up a hundred thousand and you have no degree, um, you know, there's some some question there. Um, yeah. We work with a lot of we, one one other uh, turnoff uh, for us is you know cooperation and, and commitment. Um, you know, in Jake's case, when I asked for you know document whether it's a uh, you know a balance sheet or profit and loss, you know, the turnaround time was fairly quick. Um, and so, so we really, you know, enjoy that because when we loan on a seven year, five, seven year term, it becomes what we call a, um, you know, a relationship. So we have a five, seven year relationship, uh, long-term relationship. Um, and then <clears throat> I, ha I have folks who come to me with the, uh, you know, a low credit score because on micro loan, we don't factor in the credit score. But there's, there's a few dents. And then what I would do is, um, you know, arrange a meeting uh, between them and maybe a credit counselor at Lutheran Social Service, um, <clears throat> you know, to fix some of those dents. Deans. And some of those deans are just like gym membership or, you know, a uh, department store, department store, uh, you know, card. But what happens, they, you know, some of these folks don't show up to the meeting. And I, I would call and follow up. They're like, oh, we're too busy. Or we're at the farm or we're, you know, shopping somewhere. And so character is so important uh, in terms of uh, lending out of the, this, uh, you know, uh, emerging market loan program that we have. Yeah. So, yeah. And Sai, there's a question for you in chat along those lines. Um, is it beneficial for, beneficial for a beginning farmer to show proof of an existing job or income? Or is it preferred that the grower is all in so that you know they will be fully focused on the success of the farm? What, what's the question again? I'm, I've been catching oh, that's that. right. Um, so the person is wondering if it's beneficial for a beginning farmer to show proof of their existing job or income, or is it preferred that a grower is like all in so that you know that they will be fully focused on the success of the farm? Um, for for a startup uh, farm or you know any startup business we want to make sure that they keep the job and, and slowly transition to a full time. You don't jump all in and put all your egg in that basket and then all of a sudden, you know, it didn't work out the way you want it to. Um, and then, you know, you can't pay back the loan. And the worst thing as a lender, or at least for me, is, you know, securing the, the asset or collateral and liquidating it. Um, you know, I have gone, to the farm uh, with our, uh, you know, risk asset unit and then, you know, pick up a tractor, a piece of equipment. And um, so that's the last thing that a, uh, a lender uh, wants to do. Um, so like I said, it, it is 
ultimately a partnership. Uh, you know, our like Paul and I always say, our success depend on you know the uh, the owners of uh, of Compare within our portfolio because we're a co-op. So here's um, I just want you know so this sheet this is very high tech way to show you, uh, Katie maybe you can link that in chat I'll but on the back again yeah <laughs> so it's the ones with the books on top so on the back it shows the FSA and the MDA and comp here and the things that I mentioned so if you can go to those websites uh, there's a lot of help out there let's see I'm gonna check it in time 822 all right let, I'm gonna move to the next one it fits in so uh, what I didn't mention on the what do you need to do a farm is you need some kind of plan. And we mentioned this, and this is a direct quote from a, car, a farmer. I would much rather use a shovel than a pencil. And again, this is back in Wisconsin, I worked on big dairy farms. And I think most farmers are this way. They didn't get into farming because they like bureaucracy and paperwork and regulations and certifications. But um, uh, if you, <laughs> Unfortunately, um, yeah, so the back sheet of that piece, there's the link. Uh, and these books I've listed, tons of good advice. Um, and so uh, you got to sit down and do some homework and do some head scratching. And, uh, and, and what, what uh, Sai was just saying, um, and, it, and I think the key kind of conceptual point in my mind, it's actually not about the plan it's about the planning. And um, my favorite quote on that score is from Dwight Eisenhower, uh, the great general and also president of the United States. He said, planning is invaluable. Plans are useless. So I think people get so stuck on the piece of paper that looks just right. Um, the key is to start it and start writing stuff down and, it, and, a, and your plan's never gonna be done your farm plan is going to keep going and growing and changing. Um, it's going to require paperwork and reading and research and calculating and it never stops. But, uh, you know, a business's need for information is, is like your need for oxygen. You just constantly need information and, and you need to use that to put together a plan starting with getting a loan um, and and Reese, I'm sure you did a ton of that, as you mentioned, with your land co-op. Um, and it, it can be time consuming, frustrating work. And again, if you're not a paper and pencil sort of person, there's somebody that can help you. <laughs> um, you know, if you don't do, a lot of stuff is online. If you don't do that, you know, find a 20 year old, they'll help you. But um, uh, you can't do it all by yourself. And so um, at that, I think it. I think it is one of the biggest hurdles to Carl, get, it, to get think, going. Go ahead. Uh, I think you you, you stress an important point. Um, I think when, when I was working with Jake, uh, one thing that he highlights um, in his business plan that really mitigate some of the risk is, um, you know, we talk about group of advisors, um, those that uh, you know have uh, you know been farming or uh, passionate about the whole local food uh, system. Uh, and not only that, uh, you know, we have some folks from the church, the community leader that uh, wanting to help out, uh, be part of uh, this advisory group, and and also including you, Carl. Um, so that's a uh, you know a big plus, uh, you know, to to us as a lender, um, and that really again m mitigates the risk. Can I just say that Sai is a great guy too. So I mean, he is a great resource. Absolutely. For for the for the small farm community because he understands what the person needs and it's such an advantage over going to a we funded we funded our first farm on a with a small bank um, and it was a and he was all he knew was dairy and it was really hard and, and <laughs> so having Sai in the community is is a real plus for us. Absolutely. No, it's been fantastic and uh, um, uh, FSA is another choice and that could be some more paperwork and, and these land access navigators I mentioned can help you with that. I could help you with that. Um, so, oh, I just want to, on the, on the planning part, and that could be a whole topic. I mean, how to do the books is, you know, a whole nother topic, but. 
Carl, we got quite a few, uh, a variety of questions that have yeah. come up over the course. Uh, do you have more to, more slides or should we dig into that with the last minutes we got here? Well, okay, let me, uh, so these are some uh, kind of financial planning. Ag plan at the U has a free template you can use to start plugging in numbers. Um, we have some beginning in farming information. Land stewardship project has information and Department of Ag has road and app business information. So uh, these are things that can be really helpful. Oh, and Carl. Then, uh, yes. And the computer.com, uh, Paul and I also, you know, we have some uh, business plan template along with uh, financial um, statements. Yes. Uh, yep. The cash flow balance sheet. Yep. Profit and loss. It's, it's all there. Yep. And, uh, and so you, you need it. Uh, go to a website, download it. But you got to be healthy. You got to have a positive attitude. You got to enjoy the work. Uh, when I worked on dairy farms again years ago, pick and rock, chasing heifers, bucking hay, mending fence, working our little, we would always chuckle and say, well, you got to love it. Um, if, if it doesn't give you some kind of satisfaction and accomplishment, uh, you're just not going to make it. <laughs> you have to somehow enjoy the, uh, the challenge. Uh, I don't know quite how to put that, but, um, um, and, and you know, why do you have to do this? Obviously, it's a lot of hard work. And, uh, and it's a lot of mind work, which you need to do to save your back and make some money. So um, this can all seem really overwhelming. That's a shot from Hoffa Farm, uh, doing a little hoeing. I think that's where the uh, long road to hoe came in. <laughs> Um, a 40 hours a week is, is a light work week, I think, on most farms. So uh, moving right along then. Um, but you're in luck. And again, back at that sheet, there's the people on this, web, uh, on this presentation today. There's me, there's agencies, there's growers, there's organizations, there's businesses, and they're just ready to help you. And uh, again, mid-70s. God, I kind of wanted to be a farmer. That's just, there's something deeply satisfying about it. I think we all kind of have back to the farm dream thing. But there just wasn't the resources. There wasn't Psy, there wasn't LSP, there wasn't Good Acre. Universities weren't doing anything. I probably would have been a farmer if I had this kind of a support system. Um, and then that sheet in front there is on the SFA website. Just a bunch of uh, University of Minnesota resources more towards the how to grow kinds of things. But um, so I just wanted to end, it can seem totally daunting, but there's people there to help you um, and agencies. So in the last few minutes, let's just open it up. Any, uh, any thoughts from anybody or questions, Katie, that look pretty good? Yeah, there was a few questions about uh, roadside stands. So okay. kind of three areas here, we're asking if what it takes to get set up, asking what kind of license or regulations you need to be aware of. And then thirdly, are they profitable versus being in a farmer's market? How does that comparison look? So whoever's got experience with that, I mean, jump in. I know there's a lot of growers on this call too that we haven't heard from. Well, I'll just jump in quickly. I think uh, Reese's point about the suburbs. Uh, I know of two farmers I can think of encroaching suburbs. You can't beat them, join them. There's your market right there. Uh, uh, 10th Street Farm out there in uh, uh, Afton. She has a farm stand right in her front door because she's surrounded by a bunch of houses and uh, she doesn't have to drive anywhere. And her CSA pickup is also out her front door. So it depends on where you're located, but um, I, I don't know about the regulations about farm stands. I imagine that's, I don't imagine there's too many, but I don't know about that. It's a good question. I think you can just kind of do it. I don't know. <laughs> um, um, on, you know, I, I will say that you can't always just do it. Um, my understanding yeah. for, you know, I was at my, the plot I have in Hopkins at my friend folks place. I was, uh, uh, we were talking about just putting up the tent and seeing if, you know, a lot of people stroll by if they, I could just sell produce that way. And, um, they just happened to have a friend on city council who, who, you know, they texted and, you know, they got back right away and said, uh, 
um, you, you need to go through the city and get a permit or something like that. Yeah, I think no, I was in more urban areas. I was thinking country stands in my head, but yeah, in cities, you have to do that. Now, Minneapolis allows it through the food council. We, uh, they made it so you could do it, but you have to go through some hoops if you're in city limits. And so you're going to do it or you decided not to? Um, not yet. Uh, you know, I might chase <laughs> down what, what that takes, but uh, for now, just tabled that idea. Yeah, anybody else want to jump in on that? Otherwise, there's other questions we can move on to. Sure, why don't you do that? Okay, um, so wondering if anyone has, yeah, can anyone talk about access to abandoned or open city lots? When I looked into them, it seemed like you had to be affiliated with a nonprofit and or have a lot of insurance to grow there. I think that's the case, Reese, isn't that right? With the city of Minneapolis, they prefer community gardens. That's my understanding, yeah. And yeah. so it, you have to have a million dollars insurance in Minneapolis. That sounds like a lot, but it's a hundred or two hundred or you know, two to four hundred bucks a year. So I, I think some people hear a million bucks and they go, Oh my god. But yeah, you have to have insurance if it's if it's gonna be on city property. Um and every Bloomington and New Hope and whatever is gonna be different, I think. Okay. Did, didn't you say, uh, Jacob, 400 bucks a year, you got a, a... Oh, um, yeah, my my policy is just about 400 bucks a year, yeah. And yeah. it's a, a million dollar liability yeah. program. So for sure, that's something to think about. All right, and um, yeah, along yeah. those lines with uh, urban and suburban growing challenges, how do you navigate city zoning? Um, Jacob, is that, impacted your plans for your operation this person references like mississippi mushrooms um yeah and it and specifically with zoning like residential um how does that play into how you are able to sell food yeah so um that was one of the things i went to check on before i broke ground was i um, emailed a point person at the minnetonka city hall and um you know i asked all my questions can i can i grow food on on you know it, within the city for sale is that is that zoned properly um can i sell it in the city can i um do you know farm dinners and, you know what what are all the hoops i need to jump through to you know here's what my plan would like to be and what do i have to do to get there <laughs> and um they you know just particularly in minnetonka um they said that it's completely uh, allowed and and even encouraged to grow food on your own private properties or other other people's properties. I mean, if I have an agreement, if I have an agreement with a, a property owner, that's um, I have the right to, you know, grow food there if they are okay with it. And it's it's just as uh, you know legal to sell in markets as food grown outside of the city. Um, it, that was the particular um, terms in Minnetonka. So I have heard. Of, I think other cities around the country where there's kind of some absurd laws where you can't grow food in in your yard you can only grow grass um, but uh, I think the first place to check is just you know someone uh, a city official but most places I think allow you to do so especially on private property as a, a farm stand versus taking the stuff and selling it somewhere else are two different issues Oh, and then, you know, in reference to Mississippi mushrooms too, um, one of the owners there, uh, I went to high school with and I, oh, yeah. you know, all just coincidentally, all the, um, you know, they ran into a bunch of, uh, unfortunate, you know, they got shut down pretty much because it was a zoning issue, you know, right along the waterfront. Um, I, I know it was kind of a old sort of vacant area and it was part <laughs> of, I, you know, I don't know the, all the details, but kind of a citywide revitalization project. So, you know, say, um, the synagogue or my friend's parents yard was, you know, in eminent domain for a highway to be built, you know, I would be squeezed out too. But it's, uh, um, I think that theirs were more particularly um, in the way of, uh, you know, unfortunately, some, some bigger development that was, you know, had a broader plan from the city. That's the Upper so Harbor de development. They're going to redo area. that whole area. Yep. So I would say, you know, we'd spend a lot of effort trying to figure out you know, municipal and public land, but I think uh, there's so much private land um, 
the airport commission has a bunch of acres we've been looking at the flint hills resources you know the oil refinery um and then out in the burbs like this picture there's all this land and uh like moses uh, was online here he just drove around and knocked on people's doors and asked them if if there was some farmland so um Hey, listen, we are over time, uh, but I'll glad to stay chatting uh, uh, if you'd like. Um, um, and uh, again, here's the Growers Network. Uh, keep those cards and letters coming. And again, this is a, uh, a venture that we work in together, Extension and SFA. Uh, that's a picture of one of the old stone throw lots, uh, Reese, in St. Paul there. I forget what it was, some commercial big building, but there's a uh, Huge chunk of land. They got a lot of food off there. So any uh, parting thoughts? Uh, yeah, Jake, we, go ahead. I, we got a question for Jake about uh, if you could share a bit about your business structure that you chose and why. Um, yeah, so I, uh, I chose to file as an LLC uh, with the state of Minnesota, uh, sole proprietorship, I believe, although I'd have to go back to my paperwork and double check, but I'm pretty sure that was it. And it's, um, I went that route because it was pretty, you know, quick and easy and cheap. And um, I think it's, I think it's just kind of like a base level, um, simplest way to get incorporated. I, I really don't have like a lot of, you know, I'm just guessing here. I, I don't have a whole lot of business experience. So, you know, someone might be able to chime in who understands incorporating businesses better than that, but, um, I went with that mode uh, just because it seemed uh, it was recommended and it seemed pretty simple. And, you know, I was considering and maybe one day might, you know, try to shift towards like a nonprofit model. That would be really great to, you know, be able to do some education and, and maybe be more grant funded or something and not build into only vegetable sales. But um, in the meantime, it was just, you know, the simplest way to, uh, to be able to, legally sell something I produce and um, register with the state and the feds, you know, just to track the income and, and any taxable income. Excellent. Um, Saya, do you, uh, if you don't mind, you could post your in, uh, contact information up on the chat there. Uh, uh, we can keep talking, but before anybody goes, uh, first of all, Jake, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, Thanks for having me. I think people can realize why I wanted Jake to do this because he, he's uh, smart and he it really seems what he, he's got a plan going. He knows what he's doing uh, as he learns. <laughs> and uh, Reese, thank you for joining us. Your wealth of experience is always appreciated. Um, and Cy, thank you. Um, I think Compere is just a uh, as Reese mentioned, we're so lucky to have it. So if you're thinking about, you know, these micro loans are pretty easy and they can get you started. And uh, um, so, uh, and again, Katie, thanks for handling the questions. So check out our growers network. It's intended for all kinds of growers. Um, but this year I kind of wanted to take it in different kind of the more serious growers, but also we've got some provisioners and some pretty serious community gardeners that grow for food shelves and, and things like that. So um, not sure what we're gonna do next. I think we're gonna do one maybe just on marketing. That's a whole nother realm. Uh, we might do one on youth in the garden. There's some really interesting projects in the Metro, uh, getting uh, young people involved in gardening and green skills. Um, we were thinking of having one on uh, native landscaping, not so much growing produce, but um, how we can maybe green the metro uh, for pollinators and, and other resources. So um, I think we can end it there. If there's no more uh, last questions, uh, you can unmute if you wanna chime in live. I don't know how many are left. <laughs> <laughs> we got 18 left. And thank you all for coming. I hope it was useful. Um, and it was just intended to be a kind of a reality check. Here's what you need. Uh, it's much more complicated than that. Any one of these subjects could be a whole college course, but uh, um, I, I think it was, I, I, I hope it was useful. And uh, get a hold of me anytime through the network or through my extension email. Again, thanks, thank Carl. you all. Yeah, thanks a lot.
Thanks a lot. And if you guys don't know the Good Acre, check them out. They're doing some amazing yeah. work. Uh, really, really awesome. And then check out those organizations on that sheet. If you don't know them, uh, there's a ton of really good people and uh, uh, they're ready to help you. So with that, hearing okay, guys, I vote to adjourn. All in favor, say aye. Thank you so much. Aye. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy, Thank you, everyone. The, enjoy the rain. <laughs>